Rusaria is in the back. She is our live stream moderator. Um, so if you guys are on Twitter and you see that anybody is saying, I can't hear or I can't see, will you go back and let her know so that we can try to get it fixed so everybody can participate? Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, welcome to our panel. I'm really excited about this. And um, White Balance is going to be started by Poe Johnson and Larkin Hyatt, who unfortunately couldn't join us, but Poe will be um, taking over for both of them. And uh, next we will have Sarah Lillo, um, followed by Ludmila Lupinacci. <laughs> um, and then finally, Aria Dean. So um, please, let's proceed. Hello. Um, yes, yeah, so um, unfortunately, my writing partner, Larkin Hyatt, won't be here today. I'll try to do her justice. Within the democratized digital space of YouTube, the makeup tutorial video has experienced a volcanic increase in both, just had a sort of strange moment there, um, in both, particularly in free popularity and frequency, particularly in the last three years. Far from, far from uniform in their approaches, content producers in this genre create tutorials that instruct their viewers in matters ranging from how to expertly apply uh, red lipstick, and I can speak from personal experience, it's harder than it looks, as I'm sure many of you know, um, to how produce the specialized effects created by Hollywood makeup artists, and pretty much everything else you can imagine in between these extremes. Um, what's emerged, in the, in particularly in the last three years or so, is an entirely new category within this broad digital beauty genre, which boasts its own techniques, terminology, and highly visible experts. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now entering the moment of boy beauty. Rather sweeping in its scope, Boy beauty fuses select elements of familiar feminine aesthetic standards, as well as isolated tenets of theatrical performance. Two, do two dominant figures in this burgeoning category of boy beauty are Manny Gutierrez, who is on the right, or on your left, in the left picture, on your right in the right one, um, and Patrick Starr, who both, who both simultaneously demonstrate and remediate the codified gender norms associated with standard aesthetic performance to an ever-expanding audience base. Unifying these categories, various fusions, is the generalized premise that we all have a canvas, we just have to learn to paint, which is articulated in the Boy Beauty Manifesto of 2014. To date, Manny, who only joined the YouTube community in, June, in July 2014 under the handle and Manny MUA, or Manny the Makeup Artist, currently has over 1 million YouTube subscribers and has accumulated over 34 million views. Similarly, Patrick Starr, who joined in February 2013, also boasts over a million subscribers and has accumulated over 38 million views. So from these numbers, we can see it's clear that these two are increasingly taking up digital space. What's significant about Manny and Patrick is that neither expresses their gender in ways that directly coincide with bi the binary formation of gender. Manny does not attempt to pass as a woman, he does not dress outside of normative gender standards, and he does not attempt to hide attributes associated with normative masculinity. So for example, we can see, clearly see here that he does not attempt to hide his facial hair. In so doing, Manny serves to open a space along the spectrum of gender performance for a masculine body to, appeal de to apply deeply encoded feminine aesthetic standards. Similarly, Starr does not go against the binary formation of gender in that he identifies as a trans person, a woman, or even genderqueer. Regardless of how he dresses, Starr fully identifies as a boy. While these videos illustrate an alternate gender performance, the style of makeup and ideological positions found within these self-identified boy beauty bloggers remediate and celebrate the beauty standards of the dominant culture, namely that of white feminized beauty through both the visual and technical application of the makeup itself, as well as the process by which it is presented. According to Bolter and Grusin, remediation is any text taken from its original mediation and moved towards a new one. For them, a remediated object is immediate and that its mediations 
seem invisible and hypermediated in that embedded within a remediated object are a series of other more obvious mediated forms in text. In producing a look, Manny performs a kind of figurative surgery through the contouring of the nose and cheekbones in order to remediate the, standard, the beauty standards found within the dominant culture. What's more is that Manny also intersects with some deeply entrenched racial arenas with which, it should be noted, he does not actively engage within the majority of his videos. For instance, Manny describes himself in one of his videos as a coconut, which is to say brown on the, in brown on the outside, but white on the inside, or white on the outside, rather. Furthermore, he is engaged in a parroting of racialized gendered stereotypes as seen here in his Chola video, and where he performs a class and racialized attack on Latina women that turns cultural performance into a racialized caricature. In a similar fashion, Starr creates a space for a gendered male identity that includes visualizations typically rooted in a black woman cultural aesthetic. Starr does not just dress like a black woman, he engages in a form of code switching in which he jumps from a standard American vernacular English to an incredibly aff affective African American vernacular. And yet, before we begin popping bottles in celebration over Starr's intervention of the hypermasculine black male performance, there is one problem. Patrick Starr ain't black. Patrick Starr was born Patrick Simondock to two Filipino immigrants. What's more is that Starr does not just engage in a benign black woman performance if there could ever be such a thing. He uses a double-coded process of remediation to exalt white feminized beauty. Starr's racialized performance illustrates how black feminized beauty and white feminized beauty are constructed vis-a-vis -vis of each other. And we see this throughout the history of American mediated images. Black beauty has often been embedded within the normative understandings of the white aesthetic value, from Bo Derek's hair, to Angelina Jolie's lips, to Kim Kardashian's ass. The dominant culture has cherry-picked the temporally desirable elements surrounding the visible black woman body and woven them into the beauty standards of American white women. So black feminized beauty is thus hypermediated in its hypervisibility in relationship to white feminized beauty and immediate in that those elements of black feminized beauty that the dominant culture does value become erased when folded into the white racialized image. Or to quote Paul Mooney, everybody wants to be a nigga, but nobody wants to be a nigga. To co in contrast, white feminized beauty is hypermediated in its capacity to imbue all other forms of beauty into itself in the name of white supremacy, and immediate in that, as an idea, it seems ubiquitous, natural, and eternal. The significance of this is particularly relevant when analyzing Patrick Starr's videos, especially those related to one Kylie Jenner. In Starr's 50 some odd makeup tutorials, the three dedicated to the Jenner sisters are the only ones that actively celebrate the particular look of a celebrity. So deep is Starr's fandom for the sisters, especially Kylie, that in the notes section of his second Kylie Jenner tutorial, Starr overlays his own identity with her, stating, I am Kylie, and signing off as Kylie Starr. In this very video, Starr teaches his viewers how to make their normally thin lips seem thicker and fuller, just like Kylie's. It did not matter to Starr that it had already been revealed that the secret to Jenner's fuller lips were artificial injections, or that he was al there was already a large backlash directed towards the Kylie Jenner lip craze, or for her own cultural appropriation. In actively cohering his identity to Kylie Jenner's, Patrick Starr is complicit in the ongoing and historic assault on the bodies of black women. To illustrate, while going over the process of replicating Kylie's lips, Starr engages in a tonal and linguistic form of vernacular English when he states, and the video didn't play. What he says here though is, um, we're gonna put these big DSLs, okay? And if you don't know what DSL is, that means dick sucking lips. Starr's choice of words here reflect how white supremacy has remediated black women's bodies. And it's just not that black women's bodies are destroyed and dismantled for aesthetic purposes, in all of these body parts, in the cases of all of these body parts, they're done so for to spark the white libidinal, the white male libidinal imagination. And yet, for both Manny and Patrick, there's more at stake here. Aesthetic value can be mistakenly understood as access. Neither of the boy beauty vloggers that I've discussed here today may actively court the attention of white men, at least not for sex. 
but attacking blackness and adopting white standards has long been a way to gain entrance into the holiest of domains, whiteness itself. Thus, Manny calling himself a coconut is every bit as telling as any outward manifestation of gender fandom that Patrick Starr displays. Both reveal the insidiousness of being a person of color in a white supremacist dominated country. Because for Manny and for Patrick and for so many other people, whiteness is lightning a bottle. It's the golden goose. It's the last big score. Whiteness is the final reward. And it behooves all of us to pay attention to how our media, whether produced by corporations or by amateurs, depict that idea. Thank you. Sorry, we were just talking about how I'm one of the few people in the world who doesn't use a Mac. It's taking me a moment. And I'll say this as I'm trying to bring this up. Um, so just to preview, this PowerPoint presentation is going to have very little text and mostly images. And the reason for that is because um, my method was visual sociology. And here we go. Uh, my method was visual sociology, which means that uh, images were my data. So the images that I'm going to be showing you guys are actually just samples from my data set. Um, all right. So in 2005, researchers Riddell, Thomas, and Way proposed a solution to the problem of young adults riding on college campuses, photograph them, and post the pictures online. They argued that this method could effectively deter a crowd from becoming unruly because participants could no longer behave anonymously. At the time of their proposal, Facebook had just opened up to non-Harvard students, MySpace was two years old, and Twitter was still a year away. What these researchers didn't know was that the concepts of anonymity, publicity, and privacy were just starting to enter into a phase of complete social transformation. In the 10 years since their study was published, participation in social media skyrocketed. In 2005, 7% of adults reported using at least one social network. Today, that number is 65%. Incidents of college party riots, today's trend in college violence, appear to have skyrocketed as well. A U.S. Department of Justice report defines this phenomenon as an event that occurs on or near college campuses. Most of the participants are university students. These students and others drink a lot of alcohol, and the events range in intensity from noisy parties to serious riots with injuries and property damage. And in today's digital era, these events share another common practice. Participants document them with photographs, videos, and text, and create a global digital version of their local physical experiences. Contrary to what these researchers predicted, this generation of college partiers doesn't want to be anonymous. Uh, this study explores the behavior of college rioters through their visual posts on social network sites. I analyze images taken at a 2014 riot in a New Hampshire college town where Keene State College students turned the town's pumpkin festival into a day of parties that escalated into violence. Partiers threw beer bottles at each other and at the police, uprooted street signs, started fires, and flipped a car. They also stayed connected to social media throughout the day and night, sharing public photographs of their behavior, both legal and illegal. I argue that through brazen displays of illegal behavior, performances performances of fearlessness around law enforcement, and the ability to take and publish digital photographs, participants' images are visual constructions of social privilege. Um, studies of the history of college culture in America show that partying and riots are far from new. In her book on the history of college culture, Helen Horowitz argues that what we consider to be modern campus culture began in the 19th century with a wave of violent campus revolts. At Princeton, students fired pistols and smashed windows. At the University of North Carolina, students stoned professors and whipped the president. And at Yale, students bombed a building and killed a tutor. Wealthier students who relied less upon a college education for status and economic success led the revolts. 
Such destructive behavior demonstrated the privilege these wealthy students enjoyed because the institutional consequences were often weak. This historical context would seem to debunk popular fears that this generation of college students is uniquely destructive. What does make this generation unique, however, is that their behavior plays out in two social worlds, the physical and the digital. For the first time in college history, students can publish, reproduce, learn, discuss, and create their culture on the public platform of social media. Uh, this paper takes an exploratory look at the cultural norms and practices that young adults communicate through social media photographs. What gets photographed during a party riot and what can that content tell us about both the event itself and the broader culture in which the riot occurred? How can this group's documentation of their own deviant behavior reveal their perceptions of law and deviance and reflect or contribute to a broader narrative of their position in society? So for this study, I used 145 participant-generated photographs from the Keene State College party riot collected from October 2014 through March 2015 uh, through CrowdAlbum as well as directly from Twitter and Facebook. I analyzed the images through a qualitative content analysis uh, using a non-representative sample designed to maximize the range of information in my data set uh, and to allow me to look for common themes. Uh, my coding was cross-checked by research assistants for intercoder reliability. Um, so I consider the, the photographs as cultural constructions as defined by John Berger. He writes, the photographer chooses the event he photographs. This choice can be thought of as a cultural construction. The space for this construction is, as it were, cleared by his rejection of what he did not choose to photograph. The construction is his reading of the event, which is in front of his eyes. Likewise, the photographed image of the event, which, when shown as a photograph, is also part of a cultural construction. It belongs to a specific social situation. The participants shot a range of deviant acts carrying legal or institutional consequences, most frequently drinking in public and the destruction of property. Nearly half of the photographs contain some evidence of substance use and slightly over half of the images capture behavior that could result in legal or institutional consequences such as suspension or expulsion. In this example, the photograph not only captures illegal behavior, it captures the documentation of illegal behavior. The device seen on the right side of the screen appears to be taking a photograph or a video of the scene. This means that even if this particular image were destroyed, the behavior captured here would still likely exist in the digital world. And the next few slides are an example of a strong theme that emerged in the body of images, uh, participants documenting and posing in front of the police. So police presence appears to have been an important part of the experience for rioters, uh, captured in a repetitive style in nearly 30% of the photographs. Um, and of the photographs containing police, 65% of them show them standing in a similar blockade formation. The repetition of this illustration of inactive police presence suggests that police and riot gear may have been more exotic than they were intimidating to partygoers. Alternately, intimidation might have been part of the thrill. The Keen Sentinel quoted 18-year-old Stephen French the following day who said, It's just like a rush. You're revolting from the cops. It's a blast to do things you're not supposed to do. Um, and this image was one of the most powerful in the collection for me because of its performance of normative masculinity in addition to the performance of racial privilege. Uh, seen as an inactive observing backdrop, the line of police looks more like an audience for the men posed in front. And the smiles and flexed muscles are a display of fearlessness and of power. Consistent with prior research on drinking and popular commentary on party riots, the majority of the participants shown in the images are white with groups of mostly men shown twice as often as groups of mostly women. The higher social status this group enjoys may have allowed them to have less fear of legal or institutional consequences. Yet the fearlessness that their images suggest contradicts the reality that there are consequences, or at least threats of consequences, that come from the visual evidence they provide. A statement released by Keene State the following day informed students that their documentation could and would be used against them saying that the college was reviewing images, videos, media coverage, and social media postings, and that offenders would face suspension, followed by conduct ap action up to and including expulsion. If students happened to know that authorities could use photographs as evidence prior to this statement, it did not prevent them from taking pictures of their experiences and publishing them online. If this announcement came as a surprise, however, it did not motivate students to remove the pictures from their public posts. During a year of heightened public awareness of police brutality towards people of color, these photographs generated by an overwhelmingly white group can be read as demonstrations of privilege. 
illustrating a raced relationship with law enforcement. According to the Keene Sentinel, police made 84 arrests between 12 a.m. on October 17th and 8 a.m. on October 19th, yet an arrest only appears in one image. Um, there are numerous explanations for why only one out of 84 was published online. Uh, conditions during arrest may have made photography difficult, or privacy may have been prioritized in the, these instances. But in comparison with the visibility of police arresting predominantly black protesters nationwide and the trend of viral visual documentation of police brutality, the visual silence surrounding the Keene arrests reflects and contributes to the privilege enjoyed by this social group. The absence of arrest photographs falsely communicates an absence of arrests, particularly when paired with the body of brazen selfies with police, and both contribute to our cultural understanding of white privilege. The narrative these images created was part of a larger public conversation prompted by traditional media. In April of 2014, just six months before the Keene State Riots, comedians John Oliver and Stephen Colbert satirized Keene's police militarization in separate segments on their shows. They joked correctly that the small city had purchased a Bearcat specifically in case of terrorism at the Pumpkin Festival. While the Bearcat was not deployed on, April 18th, or on October 18th, these segments had cast Keene as a comically overarmed small town. This framing had two consequences. First, it meant that the social media images of police at the Pumpkin Festival would only strengthen this narrative, confirming, Keene as, confirming the idea of Keene as a poster child for excessive policing. Oops. Sorry. Two minutes. Okay. Perfect. Um, second, by mocking Keene's fear of violence, it established Keene as a place where nothing ever happens. Through their repetitive photographs of the police force, especially through their selfies, students sent two messages into the digital world, that they were brave enough to party in a town known for police militarization, and that they partied hard enough to topple the sleepy image of Keene. The format of publication of these images, online social networking sites, reveals that deviant behavior is part of participants' presentation of self. Striking a balance between displays of deviance and normativity may be an effort to construct a particular type of deviant identity or to experience, as French expressed, the rush of deviance while continuing to enjoy a respected position in society enabled in part by adherence to social norms. For this reason, the specific types of deviance that are included or excluded are key. Photographs capture destruction but overwhelmingly exclude bodily harm. They advertise a disrespect for law enforcement but overwhelmingly exclude arrests. When the majority of people in the images are white, we can read their balance of deviance and normativity as an expression of racial privilege. Without fear of police brutality, this group illustrates police as a backdrop rather than a threat. The dearth of arrest photographs, especially compared with the prevalence of police selfies, suggests that the authority of law enforcement was unimportant to the story that participants sought to tell. These white college partiers had no need to show evidence that police could control them. They had enough pictures to assert that a weaponized police force would be patient as they pushed the limits of the law. Hi, um, I'm Ludmila. I'm from Brazil. Uh, this is the first time I make a presentation in a language other than Portuguese, so I sh should probably apologize in advance for any pronunciation, translation, or grammatical mistakes I might commit. Um, I just finished my master's in communication and information in Brazil, and that we call the final work of a master's a dissertation. I know you call it a thesis, right? Anyways, um, in my dissertation, I tried to investigate uh, the new popularity of the animated GIF, and just like the guy in the other room, I do say it with a hard G, so sorry, Tim Jeef. <laughs> and uh, I tried to understand what could possibly explain uh, the new uses and the new popularity uh, of the GIFs, and to do so, I conducted 16 interviews with people who um, qu uh, considered themselves hard users of animated GIFs. So it was in order to understand uh, the motivations and the preferences regarding the uses of GIFs. Um, 
I suppose all of you have already seen thousands of GIFs since they are basically everywhere on the internet now. And in fact, the GIF is often celebrated as the web's favorite format. But however, uh, as I realized during the interviews, not every kind of GIF is considered uh, desirable, likable, acceptable, or cool. Um, I realized that among the wide range of animations, uh, the sparkling glitter gifts are probably the ones who receive the larger amount of despise from Brazilians. Uh, those gifts are basically static images, photographic or illustrations, adorned with glitter, sparks, glow. Um, many of them consist of stars, flowers, butterflies, or even written messages. And you probably recall this kind of animation being massively used on MySpace, but in Brazil, uh, gifts with glitter ended up strongly entangled with orchid. To explain briefly to all of you who never heard of Arcut, um, it was a social network site launched in 2004. They acquired massive adoption in Brazil, becoming one of the most popular websites in the country for many years. And at first, Arcut had an aura of exclusivity, uh, since it was necessary to receive an invitation to sign up, uh, and later this restriction was abandoned. Between 2004 and 2010, uh, Orkut grew up widely in Brazil, mainly among the less privileged socioeconomic classes. And at some point, uh, there were some people who didn't even have an ID card, but had an Orkut profile. Uh, so Orkutization is a pejorative approach to the entrance of these uh, economically disadvantaged Brazilians on Orkut, as they brought um, behaviors and forms of interaction that were then frowned upon by the site's first users. And according to those who point to the supposed architization, less privileged people are responsible for bringing useless, tasteless, pointless content to the other social, uh, social network sites, such as Facebook or Twitter. So since then, actions like misspelling, posting good morning daily, uh, and of course, sharing glitter gifts are seen as classical examples of architization. Um, I believe some contextual background is needed here. Uh, in Brazil, there's a big gap between those with higher and lower income, uh, what results in an extreme economic inequality. And even though the internet has been considered for a long time a potential prolific environment to the development of a less unequal society, uh, in real life, what happens often is a reproduction of social exclusion and the stigmatization of specific groups. And I've been working with the hypothesis that the hate for glitter gifts is somehow connected with issues such as prejudice and social exclusion. Uh, since its launch, it seems like Facebook never tried too hard to become a gift-friendly platform, and perhaps this decision was made precisely to keep Facebook as far as possible from the amateurish style so typical of MySpace and Orkut. And for a long time, Facebook users begged for the acceptance of animated gifts on the site. Last year, in 2015, it finally happened. But those news received mixed reactions, and many of them were kind of negative, at least in Brazil. So here are some of the comments left by Brazilian people on articles reporting the adoption of gifts by Facebook. I'll, I'll read some of them. I bet Facebook won't last for another two years. Accessing this social network will become unbearable, just like it was with Orkut. Don't let my grandma hear about this. Gifts were the beginning of Orkut's fall. It was when the flood started. I hope the same doesn't happen to Facebook, because despite everything, I still like Facebook. No! Those images with glitter, no! <laughs> oh my god, Orkutization, here we come. I can already picture my mothers and my aunt sending me those butterflies landing in flowers in the moonlight. <laughs> so this presentation aims to dedicate closer attention to this use or for the reasons uh, given to justify the no use of those gifts that are often considered ugly or inappropriate and that are deliberately excluded of most of the visibility spaces. So as I observed, people who manifest this contempt for glitter gifts tend to defend their preferences, positioning them as a simple matter of taste. Um, however, I am to look into what is on the background of this corn, um, beyond aesthetic preferences. So what I try to understand is why do Brazilians hate so much this kind of animation? And even though our cut was already shut down, uh, it seems to me that this topic is still relevant nowadays, mainly because the word architization still is applied in Brazil every time an online interaction service, uh, services popularity increases drastically. And also, the acceptance of gifts by Facebook ended up lighting up once again this debate about the so-called architization. Um, besides, I believe this presentation addresses topics such as hate, inequality, and discrimination on online communication, then dealing with the intersection between technology and society, so I think it fits uh, the purpose of this event. So now I'm going to present some quotes about glitter gifts extracted from the 16 interviews I conducted, and I'll try to read what I mean and how they can help us understand this phenomenon. 
So, um, since the respondents often refer to this kind of animation as orchid GIFs, I ask them, what is an orchid GIF? Here are some of the answers. An orchid GIF is a GIF with sparkles and little bears, shiny stuff. It's a drawing that glows. They convey much less information than the current GIFs. With the current ones, you can even use some text. The previous ones were just little ornaments for written text. So those GIFs were often depicted uh, regarding its formal aspects, uh, illustrations with glitter, and its role as adornments in opposition to the current GIFs applied with mostly expressive intentions. And the common opinion about those GIFs. I didn't like having those things on my face, a blinky good morning. I recall seeing a lot of those gifts, but I didn't like to use it. I thought the quality was not good. And when they weren't bad, it was just too much adornment. They looked like Christmas lights. Perhaps those people who used to create those gifts shared a taste that I think is suspicious. As I recall, everything was just too colorful, kind of slob, corny. That's why I didn't use it. So, in other words, although the respondents do remember the kind of animation that used to be uh, shared on Arkut, Roughly all of them attempt to make an effort in clarifying that they never agreed to or engage with uh, the use of those gifts. So I asked them, are glitter gifts used nowadays? Do you see gift, uh, glitter gifts being used nowadays? And they said, oh yes, I see it on old people's Facebook. Oh yeah, for sure, my mother uses. It's something of typical of aunts, of grandmas. They are outdated, tacky, slob, tacky. I think those tacky messages are typical of older people, of those with lower income. I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's something I observe. It's just like people often say, Facebook has been archetized. It's something that I see other people and people with less access to culture use those gifts and they think they're cool. It may sound arrogant, but this is how I see it. And finally, I asked them, have you ever used glitter gifts? If I used it, it was just for fooling around, as a joke. For me, this style has always been ridiculous. This is good, right? I've always had critical sense. I used to collect the ones extremely tacky with lots of glitter and send them exactly, exactly because they were ugly and corny. So that means that when the respondents used this kind of animation, it was precisely, it will be considered ugly or tacky. Uh, it was on purpose and mainly with sarcastic intentions. So even though the despise for glitter gifts is always justified as a matter of taste or aesthetic preference, it can be overlooked the fact that the content for those animations is as well a form of social distinction. Um, while the respondents admit they didn't make use of those gifts, they are also indicating that they have a better taste or a more sophisticated style than those people who find glitter gifts uh, beautiful or cool. And the common sense seems to be that people who like glitter gifts are the ones who don't have access to a supposed higher culture. Um, as I see the, the discourse of the respondents, uh, as well the, the comments I presented at the beginning, uh, sound in many cases as manifestations of ethnocentrism. That means uh, the non-acceptance and the discrimination of groups with different habits, practices, and culture. It's basically a lack of tolerance to difference. And I see this as a form of ethnocentrism basically because it suggests the belief that one's culture is better or more acceptable than others, uh, which are immediately judged as foolish or trash. And just like in every other case of the so-called orchidization, uh, the hatred towards glitter gifts demonstrates uh, a discrimination against people of less privileged socioeconomic classes. And besides that, according to my interpretation, it reproduces as well a, an ageism, uh, that means this style of animation becomes unwanted also for being seen now uh, as an old people's thing, used mainly by aunts or grandmas. Um, so I think it could be said that in Brazil, the, the use of gifts on market was so outstanding, and not necessarily in a positive way, that once the new Facebook would start to accept animations, many people immediately connected the animated GIF with the idea of glitter butterflies and amateurism. So the complaints about the adoption of gifts by Facebook seem to be a result of this corn, like if it was a hangover from the use of gifts on Arcut. That doesn't mean though that Brazilians don't use gifts on Facebook, but glitter gifts are rarely seen. Um, the most prolific ones are those that consist of extract videos, movies or TV shows used for expressive intentions. And we also have some curious creations such as uh, biographical gifts, like this one of Daenerys Targaryen, where um, they present a kind of resume or curriculum, like a list of qualities of a character or celebrity. I won't have time to translate to you, but think about it. <laughs> and another thing that came up to my mind and that I think it's curious is that uh, Snapchat is finally a big thing in Brazil after a four year delay. Anyways, and 
Uh, I think one of Snapchat's most successful features nowadays in Brazil are those lenses that are usually full of sparks, rainbows, puppies, and stuff like that. Stuff that could fit perfectly on the, restrict the descriptions of glitter gifts given by my respondents. Uh, so I feel like in Snapchat, this cuteness is allowed and even encouraged by the app. So perhaps the intersection of those contents could become a new object of study. Why not? Um, finally, I know the core of this panel is the matter of race. And if you look at the stati statistics, generally speaking, African descendants are usually the ones with less access to education in Brazil. So yes, there's probably a racial factor on the deeper layers of this problem. But since this aspect did not appear explicitly on my respondents' quotes, I didn't feel comfortable uh, including on the presentation. But I think it could be uh, investigated for the research just that as the gender aspect. Because if glitter gifts are often associated with aunts and grandmas and never with uncles or grandpas, then it's because they use this scene as a feminine practice. So I think this also could be addressed on future studies. Thank you. Sorry, it's going to take a second because I got here late. Um, one sec. <laughs> I'm Aria, by the way. Um, Is it not able to use Keynote? Is that a thing? That's, it can? No. Oh. Okay. Trying to open it. Um, it's not super essential, but it says it can't be opened on Keynote, so I'm just going to have to go. Oh, okay. And I lose my computer. Okay. Um, I'm Aria Dean, um, and my talk today is called White People Be Like race in the in Instagram or platform-based meme. Um, it's kind of migrated away from considering whiteness as much, but of course there's sort of a dialogue. Um, and my presentation was mostly just memes, so it's not like the most <laughs> important thing in the world. Um, but basically what I'm interested in is um, considering the relationship between blackness and memes, are memes black and is blackness a meme potentially? Um, and I was going to open with a clip from this 1978 video piece by Ulysses Jenkins, um, where he, it's called Massive Images, you should look it up. But basically, in the video, he is um, standing in front of this like, set of TVs, and he wants to keep repeating this refrain that you are a massive images you've gotten to know from years and years of TV shows. And it flashes between him with these TVs and a sledgehammer rearing back to destroy these TVs, and then intercuts. Um, like black representations or representations of black people from mass media from like the 20th century. And um, towards the end of the video, he rears to smash the sets again and he says, oh, I'd love to do this, but what does that mean? And so I'm sort of interested, I think, overall in this question of why can't he smash the TVs and what does that mean for him as a black person? Um, sorry, I'm just like, going to try to scoop this. Okay. Um, but so yeah, race and the platform-based meme, um, it, memes are still my focus, and this idea of memes and blackness is what I really want to tease out. Uh, and the sort of the argument that I'm interested in exploring that is, I keep looking up here as though I have something that I don't, um, uh, is that, yeah, so if we consider blackness as a meme and memes as black, what kind of territory does that open up for considering the black self, subjectivity, and the body that in some ways might be new and in other ways has been well-traveled by Afrofuturists and Afro-pessimists, and thinking about the fact that there might be some power in the meme and its distributed, ever-shifting nature and poor image status, using Hiro style, um, for those of us who are heavily policed, whom the state and other forces would like to make fixed, and maybe the meme structure as well as its content can gesture towards some sort of post-representational, post-identity politic, something that I think would be useful at this particular moment. Um, but before going any further, tell my best to define meme. 
Um, and I try to use a two-pronged definition, the first part of which is the classic definition, which defines something as a meme based on how it circulates, um, an element of culture or a system of behavior that may be considered to be, be passed from one individual to another by non-genetic means, so especially imitation, and then specifically, as defined by Google, a humorous image, video, piece of text, etc., that's copied, often with slight variations, and spread rapidly by internet users. So I feel like we all kind of have a sense of what that would be. Is that okay? I don't want to assume anything. Um, and then a more recently emerged definition pertaining to more of a what, which is the contemporary meme as a format or a template, often ripped from Twitter with like the you know a white like box with like the text and the image below. If you guys, does that? Okay, <laughs> I just want to just like, um, and so. Uh, yeah, like it's often like cropped, zoomed, like goes from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook and like circulates across platforms. Um, and there's also part of this meme definition that I think has to go unspoken a little bit because sometimes you just kind of know it when you see it. Uh, for instance, the Mr. Krabs meme, I think is a good example of that, <laughs> which just like now if you see something that's got that like kind of spin blur on it, it can be almost any picture and it kind of like says what it announces itself as something related to that. Um, and I really I had a lot of Mr. Krabs memes that I wanted to show. That's okay. <laughs> um, so alongside this recently emerged format, we've also witnessed black user-produced content drift toward the center of, the, of internet culture. Social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook um, appear to be primary channels of circulation. And within these channels, the primary cultural form, the meme, again, is extremely black. And they're black in a number of ways. So for one, there's the presence of black vernacular. The captions that pro proliferate alongside images range in sentiment, but the language used most often draws from classic black vernacular, a mittens of words, the use of bruh, fam, nigga as addresses. Um, and additionally, we witness the consistent presence of black people in the images and videos that are circulated. And here I was going to show the what are those meme with the she, you know, like, what are those? <laughs> and, then, and then the Nick Young question mark meme, like, you know, that one. Um, so we see black people, we hear black people. Um, and the Nick Young example is good because there's like, you know, it's a nonverbal thing. It's just that image with the question marks and it's basically used to be like, you know, like, what the fuck? Like, ah. Um, so together these objects and the countless others in circulation, literally countless others, create a widespread visibility for blackness in the mainstream on the internet. And we can presume that the majority of this content is created and initially disseminated by black users circulating within networks like black Twitter and on Vine, a platform dominated by users of color. But moreover, there's a palpable blackness to the meme in 2016 that almost escapes speech. And I found this really difficult to verbalize myself until reading Laura M. Jackson's The Blackness of Meme Movement, in which she discusses the blackness of memes, arguing, as I do here, for an inherent blackness in this form of production. She writes of the use of black vernacular and presence of black bodies in labor and representation, but goes on to highlight the ways in which, and I'll quote her here, quote, not only can the origins of many memes be found in black creators or online black communities, but memes, ap memes appear also to model the circulatory movement of black vernacular itself. So Jackson's taken notice of this weird thing about memes, that the mode of production and circulation of them is really, really black. It feels inextricably linked to those of impro the <laughs> improvisational forms that have come before it, most of which happen to be found in music, blues, jazz, house, hip hop. Uh, the memes tactical similarity to historical black cultural production uh, makes it predictably vulnerable to appropriation and capture. The blackness of meme movement is not limited to survivalist measures, but it extends to the involuntary movement to, into non-black networks. Memes move like blackness in their seeming transferability. Memes like blackness are forms that somehow, for whatever reason, um, allow for a sense of collective ownership among those who come into contact with them, black or non-black. The meme is open to appropriation and interpretation in the hands of whoever holds it for a moment. And we find ourselves where we were with jazz, with rock and roll, with house, and with hip hop where black people innovate only to see their forms snaked away, value siphoned off by white hands. So from a labor-oriented perspective, there's a noticeable imbalance between cultural and effective labor performed by black users and material gain exchange for said labor. Both, and like, so we're well aware that we're watching the same story of American culture play out in a new arena. But I would argue that it feels a little more complicated considering like the attention economy, where the success of a product is measured by likes and numbers of views or yeah, members of likes and views, and how far its ultimate reach is on social media platforms. Admittedly, many memes are created for the very purpose of virality, of appropriation. Flows of labor and capital operate quite differently <laughs> now than how they functioned when early black music was co-opted uh, by the American music industry. Santiziana Terranova writes in Free Labor, this is in 2006, but I think it stands, quote, rather than capital incorporating from the outside the authentic fruits of the collective imagination, it seems more reasonable to think of cultural flows as originating within a field that is always and already capitalism. So rather than a linear relationship between black production and non-black production, or not, sorry, black production and non-black consumption, 
memes move in cycles of production, appropriation, consumption, and reappropriation that renders an authentic collective imagination hard to pin down. We don't see an authentic black cultural expression produced for its own sake, commodified and watered down all the time. Instead, we see black, black users producing content a mile a minute, Instagram pages making plugs to follow them, plugs for each other, like follow in the next five minutes before it goes private, like that kind of stuff. Um, within this already, always already capitalist field, we are then expected to take visibility as a sort of currency. You gotta get your name out there. Um, to quote Nicholas Boyard, who is a little basic, I think, and kind of dated, but uh, <laughs> it st I think it stands, I think it stands. In post-production, he writes, that artists' intuitive relationship with, an, with our history is now going beyond what we call the art of appropriation, which naturally infers an ideology of ownership and moving toward a culture of the use of forms, a culture of constant activity of signs based on collective ideal sharing. And so I think this is like a really obviously like Western male utopian perspective, like, oh, everyone's gonna share, it's great. Like, but I think 15 years after that book's publishing, it actually like feels like he's onto something in that I didn't think just with this idea of the meme threatening an ideology of ownership. And not to the degree that like, oh, it's just like this free and open network of sharing. I think we're very clear that's not how things have ended up. Um, but his sharing his collective ideal feels not entirely wrong. But I think the emphasis is not on the act of sharing, but the visibility gained through that act. The meme is a prime example of culture in 2016, potentially replaces this ideology with another form of value defined by velocity, intensity, and spread. And that comes from Hito Style in Defense of the Poor Image. Velocity, intensity, and spread. And I don't know if she's fully trying to consider memes necessarily as they are now in this essay, but it might as well be like a thesis on the form. Um, in describing the poor image, she writes, quote, and sorry, I have a lot of quotes, but, <laughs> quote, it presents a snapshot of the effective condition of the crowd. The condition of the image speaks not only of countless transfers and reformattings, but also of the countless people who cared enough about them to convert them over and over again, to add subtitles, re-edit, or upload them. And then I made a meme that was gonna be here that says that feel when Hito Style can actually describe the nature of that feel when. <laughs> so that was like the big moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she's talking about this thing that like, two minutes, okay, cool. Um, yeah, this thing that, you know, we all, I feel like that really speaks to the condition of like when you see a meme, when you repost a meme, et cetera. Um, but so there's another strange presence in Defense of the Poor Image, something that I always noted in the text, but recently saw other black artists and writers pick up on like on Twitter, I saw people talking about it. Um, the poor image is not just a meme, but the poor image might also be black. Or rather, blackness might be a poor image. And again, this is sort of like flowing back and forth between our memes black and is blackness a meme. But the way that Style talks about poor images circulating, having been pushed out of the mainstream and into new alternative circulations, rings really true of blackness. Again, drawing on Jackson, we're talking about black movement here. And I can't go through a defense of the poor image and pull out all the quotes that speak to this condition. We would be here forever. And I think that's probably actually now I know a whole other essay that could be written. Um, but basically, I think the meme is poor image. The poor image itself survives and moves as blackness does. I think that now entering this argument through the back door, Shiles' essay shows us the inheritance of blackness as memeness. Like in a sense, the African diaspora is a meme in a weird way. Blackness is a meme, and blackness is always already mediated. And blackness is more than anything one of the longest running viral media campaigns in the history of advertising and mass media. Blackness is a poor image in its circulation, but blackness is also a copy in motion, a ghost of an image. That's another quote from her. And so circling back to Ulysses Jenkins, who you didn't see, but you should all watch the video. Um, we left him with the sledgehammer lifted as he's frozen, waiting to smash the TV sets, but he can't. In some sense, this video, Massive Images, shares a conceptual space with Styles' poor image. Jenkins understands that he's an identity, quote, compressed, reproduced, ripped, remixed, lacking in original, original. It's low res, it has been copied and pasted countless times. When he asks what would happen if he were to destroy the TVs and the images they display, he knows the answer. There would be nothing left. This places us at an undeniably Afrofuturistic, perhaps Afro-pessimistic point. It's not quite a conclusion, but more of a juncture. There's a lot more to be said here. But the meme is poor image and as black operates against the rich image, the full bodied high res sort of representation that a 20th century identity politic and visual theory taught us to strive for. Fred Moten writes that quote, part of what's necessary is the realization of an analytic that moves through the opposition of voluntary secrecy and forced exposure. What's needed is some way to understand how the underground operates out in the open and perhaps deeper still. The meme and maybe social media asks us to reorganize the opposition that Moten references. The meme operates outside of a high res identity politic instead inheriting the charge of Afrofuturism to create a hyper-embodied black consciousness. Afrofuturistic thought recognizes the Atlantic slave trade as a prototypical networked culture. In a sense, we've been digital. Maybe we're coming into our own now. The meme seems almost too well suited to black culture leading into these states via poor image, a copy without origin. The whole of the body collectively must be understood as comprising the system in its entirety, and as such, the body of blackness is constantly in flux.
Thank you. Okay, thank you all for such really good presentations. I kept wanting to be like, yes, the entire time, um, but I didn't want to interrupt. So um, they're really good. And before I sort of open the room up for questions, I had questions or a question for really all of you, but um, really inspired by ARIA and post presentations. So it seems like the memes um, or even in Poe's case, the performance of blackness as sort of a type of digital blackface. And I'm not the first person to say this at all by any means. Um, but do you guys feel like we, and I'm saying we as a black woman, um, and I don't know in any other way that I could possibly mean we, but do you think that we have some agency to resist sort of that blackface performance? Or what is that? What does that look like? Um, we have um, to understand the question. We have any way to resist um, this kind of digital blackface that's occurring in the cultural moment? Right. Exactly. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, yes, in the sense that we can do things that we do. We can write, and what we've seen also, like on Twitter and on Tumblr and in other social media sites, is this active kind of like when something happens, people push back against it. The thing is, though, the no part of that is that we can't control our own image. I mean, this is part of the Afro-pessimist argument itself, is that we are never in control of our own image because it's always the, uh, we are always ontologically an object. And so we have never, we have no ultimate power over that. So we can only resist, I guess would be the best way of putting it. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I would agree. I think that it's like, um, yeah, the best way or the most effective way so far I've seen is just a series of correctives, like the kind of like hashtag clap back kind of like Twitter <laughs> yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that it's, yeah, I mean, you really <laughs> that said it all. But I also think that sort of, I think part of what I'm interested in with the meme thing is acknowledging that, like, not thinking about blackness as like these, these discrete images, but more of this like continued circulation. And I think that the way that black culture moves so quickly on the internet, like, that speed is one of the things that actually is, I think, a resistance. Like, you can't catch it, and people want to be like, oh, I'm, you know, going to latch onto this and, like, yeah, this digital blackface thing. But I think that the speed, it just keeps ramping up, and that's one way people, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, that's something that I've like, I mean, I think all these thoughts are things that are very like the beginnings, little seeds of thoughts, and I don't feel totally comfortable like speaking to it, just kind of just like, I, it's it's such like fraught territory in my mind that I'm like, okay, like I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I do think that yes, like there's something there, and yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I think if you're looking for a particular writer, I want to get his name right, Andre Bach, I think writes exactly about that. Um, it's actually signifying cultural practices on Twitter or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, signifying as a technocultural practice on black Twitter. Yeah. I love him, so. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, in the front. And will you guys repeat the question that way the people at home can hear it on the live stream? So to reiterate, you're asking if um, the individuals I spoke about were engaging this kind of sort of digital rhetoric process um, as a way, because they don't have sort of a knowledge of their own history. Um, I would say 
I don't want to speak to them individually, right? So I mean, what I can say is, it would appear as such, but I can't say that for certain. I think what also does happen though is that, and this is something that Arya's presentation and, and both when my talk about is that um, blackness exists already. It is this thing that people feel like they have access to always. And so they grab it because it's there mm -hmm. and it, because it's already existent before them. So I'm critiquing them to some degree in this, in my presentation, but um, this is a long history. We're going like 200 years history of this, right? So we can't, um, that history exists well before them. It'll likely exist well after them. So I'm not gonna say that they don't have knowledge of their own history. I think it's much more that this history is simply something that for some reason, and I mean, we know the reasons. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> are always there and always that people feel like they can occupy and that it's this easy form to say like, I can grab this vernacular, I can grab this visual performance, I can grab any kind of thing that I want from um, blackness and take it and put it on myself. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting that in Lunmila's presentation, it's sort of the exact opposite thing is happening, that they can say, this is this. And you said that you didn't want to say that it was blackness, but, you know, with an intersectional perspective, especially in Brazil, we know the history of the Afro-Latino, um, that contention point. So it's like you can... Um, divert from the blackness and say, or the class, whatever it is, and say, oh, I don't want this. Did you want to speak a little bit more to that? Uh, yeah, actually, I, what I meant was not to say that I, uh, that I feel like they're not connected. It was just that because it not appeared uh, explicitly on the, the respondents uh, quotes. Um, and honestly, I don't know if I feel comfortable talking about this. I don't know if I have the authority to talk about this. But I agree 100% with you. I think it, it is connected. And Brazil also has a big uh, problem of racism as well. And yeah, I think you, can, you cannot uh, disconnect one thing from the other. Yeah, I think they're, they're basically together. Is there any other questions? Yes, in the back middle. Yes, I think I think you could, but I think <laughs> yeah, I think you could. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that uh, very often uh, behind this aesthetical preference, there's something else. And you know, I think uh, through those those sentences I I presented to you, uh, you could see that they they okay they talked about they they're ugly they're tacky they're lobby, but there's something else going on, and that's what I, I was trying to highlight. But yeah, I think you could say, I'm not the glitter gift police, so anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could say. Yeah, I saw another hand. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the big, <laughs> the big ask. I think that, I mean, it, that, yeah, the, the ethical or sort of political aspect of it in that sense is what I find so difficult because I think it's great to, to see, I think that I benefit from seeing like consistent representations of like, you know, like the hashtag like blank, black Thanksgiving, like, you know, like that's great. Like, <laughs> um, but at the same time, yeah, it's like to be visible is to open yourself up to be disciplined, to be pegged in a certain way. Um, and I think that what I am, what I was trying to, or what I am continuing to try to figure out for myself is, is there a way that the meme is this like post-representational object? So it's like, 
yes, like there's an image of a black person, but do these images coalesce into something that is beyond an image in a way? And I know that sounds really loopy and crazy, um, but I think that there's something to be said because of that iterative aspect where it's like going in all these different directions and, and it's not really fixed. I think that it, yeah? No, I, I, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like black, not like so, like basically like Pub Jerry's being able to like uh, capitalize yeah. on these black themes and like reproduce and repackage them and then like gain mm-hmm. dimension for them. Whereas like at the end of these like ten to like eight like eighteen year olds who are producing these themes who aren't financially yeah. free. So it's like that like whole yeah. authorship and like yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, when there's money involved. I mean, like, there was that whole thing last year where someone got mad at the fat Jewish for, like, mm-hmm. and that was, like, a bunch of comedians were mad. It's like, well, what about the black kids who are, like, you know, and I don't I don't really know how you approach that or deal with it. Um, I was going to say something else, what you said. Um, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> but I think that, fuck, I can't remember what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, so to kind of really kind of address your paper even so in some ways more than mine, um, because what you're asking in some ways is like that question that's been asked since like Du Bois or even truth, right? Like what is blackness? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and that's a question we're still struggling with. So I think there's, there's right, there's this, there's always already this commodified notion to it, right? Like there's no way to separate blackness, particularly in the American concept outside of slavery, middle passage, and of course thus capitalism, right? <laughs> so what do we do with this thing? So I think the meme is both a kind of cultural capitalism on the side of like the 18 and 19 year old kids who are creating and then proliferating the images, but of course then it also means getting people money on the end that they're not gonna have access to, right? So blackness is always gonna be this kind of um, tense state where we don't have full autonomy over it, but we can sort of try to gain more and more over time. And I think that's what memes do now. I think it's an attempt for people, particularly outside of the academy and outside of the university to say like, look, we, can, we have an access to blackness too. And our blackness is just as valid as Du Bois or Baldwin's or whomever's. Yeah, and actually on the sort of like a point that you just made, I was gonna ask you, how are you defining um, a black female aesthetic? Because you talked about it in your talk. And so talking about how we can't define blackness, I just was like, what, are, what about the, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't hazard to try, right? And that's my kind of point in that, is that the black female aesthetic is um, both a part of blackness in terms of sort of originary blackness. It's both sort of borrowed from um, cultures that came prior to Middle Passage and after Middle Passage, and it's also a part of this larger mediated construction that has nothing to do with black women or black people. Yes. And I think that's <laughs> why like, I couldn't define it because it's permeable, but it's also ever-changing and it doesn't have a specific site or location. And that's the complicated idea about blackness itself is that it doesn't rest anywhere in particular. It's sort of everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Oh, um, let's, uh, uh, in the stripes in the back. <laughs> Well, I don't know, there's, I think like a lot of like feminist like internet theory stuff, I mean, I still think it does, it's like, you know, woefully limited in some ways, but I think that that's usually helpful. I also think, I mean, I'm a, I mean, this is like maybe a bad methodology, but I'm a big believer in just like cherry picking things that I think are, you know, like I'm just like, okay, like this person isn't thinking about me, but I'm just going to take it and do what I want with it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. And I, but I think a lot of recent like black cultural theory too just happens to overlap. 
Uh, yeah, I would agree with that completely. Um, like, I took remediation, and then I use remediation in all kinds of weird ways, and I know Bolter and Gerson had no intention of it being used that way. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, black feminist theory in particular. So um, Kimberly Crenshaw may, isn't cited, but she's everywhere, right? She's all yeah. throughout what I'm doing. Um, bell hooks. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. Um, Patricia Hill Collins. I, I can just keep going, right? So I won't do that. But yeah, I would say that... Um, the digital and the body are so linked and they don't seem so all the time. And I think even when people talk about sort of digital bodies, they're forgetting that for so many of us, that isn't just like an analog, that's not a metaphor, that is it. Like our bodies can be dismantled and destroyed at a moment's notice because yeah. of something that happens online. So I try to keep that in mind all the time. So part of it's not methodology, part of it's kind of like um, cultural thought and like just understanding. <laughs> just like really like <laughs> um, yeah, there's a really I, really great quote from um, the artist Hannah Black that I was referring to a lot when I was doing this, where she talks about like why don't we try to think about like these things, like these like internet related things, and and I'm sort of you know twisting it a bit, but in terms of like the larger history of bodies circulating like globally, like in terms of like physically, but you know in terms of capitalism, all these things, and I think that if you really just think about things in that, yeah, like what you're saying, that larger historical sense, then everything kind of comes together and it's always the same story, kind of. Um, um, Ruth. Sure, so I haven't put, I mean, I'm trying to think about the activist question. I'll say this side of it first. Um, so one of the really interesting things about the selfie is that, <clears throat> and about the pictures overall, so the division between social media images and traditional media images is like the, the eye, the perspective. So um, without social media, we might be getting pictures that were taken by traditional media sources of this riot. So we would have um, photographs that were taken by people who were not participants, who were viewing it from the outside. Um, and in this case, uh, I have a really great quote and I wish that I had it with me because I'm forgetting it exactly. But basically, you see the blend of three, di three different roles with these photographs. So you see uh, photographers, reporters, and rioters and everybody kind of becomes everybody takes turns in that role because you could be taking a selfie and the uh, devices are so ubiquitous that you could be taking a selfie and if you're in a crowd you have somebody who's right next to you taking a picture of something behind you and then you are appearing in their image while appearing in your own image um, and so you become the subject you become the photographer you kind of embody all of these roles at the same time um, as for the activist question, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can speculate on that. Um, I think it, I think it probably kind of just relates to the same thing, where it's a um, a way of reflecting. This was the quote. There was a photographer from the Keen Sentinel um, who talked about sort of this issue and was arguing that these type of images are a way of people reflecting back their own presence at the scene. Um, and I think that in either case, or in any case, whatever situation you are in, um, you are, it's simply a, w a way of showing that I am here and I am part of this. I don't know, I think that's the best answer that I have. Sorry, I feel like I didn't really touch on the activism part. Uh, yes, the very back.
outside of sort of Baltimore and Ferguson and Black Lives Matter and Black activism in general, is there a sense that they're like, um, yeah, enacting something that has actual like activist social tension in other contexts? It's possible. Um, I think that that's difficult to speculate on. And one one thing that my project um, doesn't do. So my project was a very short-term exploratory project, and one thing that I would love to do is actually talk to rioters and um, and talk to the people who produced these pictures and get a clearer idea. Like I can speculate on why you know the two men were posed the way that they were in front of the line of police, um, but ultimately I don't know what their goal was, was there a specific audience that they were hoping to reach with, with this, was this, you know, did they have a specific person in mind that, or was there a reason that they were clearly thinking that, you know, this is going to be a really cool thing to do or something. Um, so I think that there's probably a mix of conscious and subconscious intention that goes into this. Um, and I think it would also matter, you know, the the age of these participants, the awareness that they have of national, you know, current events. Um, yeah, I think that that's a, a complicated question, and I think that it's entirely possible, but I think it would take more research methods to figure that out. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. So So wait, to be clear, does your question, st it almost sounds like a chicken and egg question. Are yeah, you, so. okay. <laughs> so, so you're trying to ask if the social media representations. Well, I'm seeing if this influence, I guess, is the best way to bring it back to Sure. Um, I think that this is enough of a trend um, that I, I think that the two, I'm not sure I can't even say which one started first because the part of part of the point of this is that there's always been college violence. There's always <coughs> been violent clashes at colleges, um, you know, brought on in part by the the privilege of college students. Um, so this isn't a new. It's similar to you know the images of police brutality. It's not like that started just since you know we have iPhones now. It's something that we, we're just able to see it now. So I think that um, college students behavior and involvement with violence um, has been relatively consistent and then I but I do think that since this is a trend the documentation of party riots I think that we're starting to see a blend where it's probably a little difficult to separate the digital and the physical experiences yeah thank you guys again um, all of you for excellent presentations and excellent commentary thanks